Good morning. One belt, one road. Xi Jinping's grand vision, the world's biggest project, and its aim to make China great again. 60 countries are involved, from Asia to the Middle East and Europe. The message, everyone who signs up will be a winner. There are plans, for example, for a pipeline and ports in Pakistan, bridges in Bangladesh, and railways in Russia. All with the aim of creating what China calls a modern day Silk Road, a new era of globalization. But of course, views are sharply divided. There are some who say it's a massive waste of money with very little practical gain. And there are others who say it will kickstart worldwide development. Its ambition is huge and the scope is immense. But how are they actually going to go about doing this? And what about all the political and security concerns along the way? Well, my expert panelists are going to try and answer some of these questions. We have with us here on the uh, stage, Secretary Richard Spencer, the Secretary of Navy for the United States. Uh, we've got General Brian Fenton, the Deputy Commander for the United States Pacific Command. Edward Luce, Washington columnist and commentator for the Financial Times. And Ambassador Ong, the one-time Secretary General of ASEAN and now with the Nanjiang Technological University in Singapore. Let me begin uh, by asking you, Edward, if you could just sum up in 30 seconds what the One Belt, One Road actually is. So it's, it's something that President Xi in his first term um, announced in 2013 in Central Asia. The New Silk Road was what it was quickly dubbed, but it has since become uh, a, a much more formal um, multi, multinational effort. And of course, earlier this year, the One Belt, One Road initiative, since renamed the Belt and Road Initiative uh, Summit was held in China, 30 heads of state, 60 countries. We're talking about a trillion dollars over five years of infrastructure projects that span you know, a ports in Pakistan, which are already underway, by the way, um, buying up the Port of Piraeus in Athens, Mombasa, Nairobi railways, $65 billion already in debt from Venezuela through various projects. There's not actually that much coherence to this from a commercial point of view, except to say that, that China has a lot of surplus capital, uh, that its rate of growth at home for the capital it's investing is falling. There's just so much excess capacity and it's exporting a lot of cap capital and getting others to join in. The, the one other point that's really interesting here is it's obviously not just a surplus domestic savings situation. It is a central political goal of Xi Jinping. And we all know that Xi Jinping thought was elevated into the Chinese constitution last month. He joined Mao Zedong and, and Deng Xiaoping. Um, what was perhaps less remarked upon is that the One Belt, One Road initiative was also incorporated into the Chinese constitution. And this has a, a lot more than a five, 10 year horizon. All infrastructure projects are very long horizon projects. And so if Xi Jinping wants to prolong his power, the fact that this initiative, his initiative, as much as the great leap forward was Mao's initiative, is there enshrined in the constitution now alongside Xi Jinping's thought should give you some sense of the longevity, not just of the infrastructure projects, but of Xi Jinping's, of the arc of his political career. General Fenton, a lot of people are comparing this to the Marshall Plan. Would you say that's the case? Um, I, I'd say there are probably comparisons, and we do hear that. Uh, you know, though as, as I look at it, and certainly as, as I've had the chance to see it, you know, if you look at the Marshall Plan, uh, a significant effort to, to rebuild Europe, uh, certainly one that I think went in with uh, high aspirations and goals and was part of the framework that eventually got set up that has guided us for these 70 years and led to a very, very prosperous era, uh, as we talked about yesterday. I think uh, uh, probably in the enormity, yes. In the contrast, though, uh, certainly with the Marshall Plan, as, as, as I've had the chance to study, uh, a lot of leans toward grants. I think on the uh, One Belt, One Road or the Brick Road Initiative, uh, there are uh, loans, maybe some of them high interest loans. Um, 
uh, an import of labor from China to many of the projects, and maybe to all the projects, in a way we didn't do with the Marshall Plan. Um, I think on the, certainly on the, the scale and size of uh, expenditures that China's undertaking, there, there's uh, that, that comparison to the Marshall Plan is out there, though I'm certainly on today's dollars, what China's got against that is, is uh, exponentially larger. I think the key takeaways are, I think, uh, uh, maybe the, uh, the import of labor, uh, the high interest loans, um, maybe even some practices that look nothing like we did in the Marshall Plan with 99-year leases. Some folks have called them predatory. Uh, the way China goes about it, and I don't think that was the case when we talked the Marshall Plan back in the. In, uh, Secretary uh, Spencer, I'll bring you in because it, China, the way it deals with nations, is very transactional. So, as General Fenton was saying, there they don't necessarily take into account corruption, for example, or, or human rights issues. If you want to do business with us, we're open. Uh, yeah, before I answer that question, uh, uh, we're all here as, as, as friends and uh, allies, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't share with you that don't know, we have a situation of distress on the high seas right now. Our Argentine friends have lost contact with one of their submarines 36 hours ago. Uh, the U.S., the U.K., the Chilean Navy are all on loaning uh, assets and services to help in the location and recovery of this, but I would ask that... Uh, for the crew and their loved ones, we keep them in our thoughts and prayers as this unfolds. Um, that being said, uh, yeah, exactly, uh, it's transaction oriented and uh, coming from the uh, world of finance prior to taking this role, uh, we always viewed uh, uh, capital as the universal lubricant of trade and global prosperity. And when we talk about weaponizing it, it puts a different spin on it. Um, and as I was thinking about uh, the topic and the title, I really flashed back on what happened in the, uh, in, the, in the global financial world, and we actually have weaponized it. There's a, there's a product called debtor in, finance, debtor in possession financing, which is when someone is about to go under, uh, a financial source comes in at the last minute and provides a financing package that if, in fact, the company fails or the asset fails, the, the provider of the finance owns that asset. I see nothing different in what China is doing with uh, their expansion right now, which uh, if you look at Sri Lanka, if you look at the Philippines, uh, Piraeus, it's a dual-edged sword. Yes, we're seeing economic benefit, but at what cost? And over what term are we seeing this? Uh, we have to have open transparency uh, as we all work together as global trade partners. Uh, we look at Djibouti. All of a sudden, the garrison that's being put in Djibouti and the army uh, uh, numbers uh, from the PLA are increasing there. Um, it's something we really have to keep an eye on uh, and monitor very closely. The U.S. Navy, its strategic overarching role is to keep the sea lanes of, 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 of transportation open because they are the arteries of trade for global prosperity. We will continue to do that and we will continue to keep a sharp eye and ply the freedom of navigation uh, actions that we do in order to keep the lanes open. Uh, we really have to keep an eye on this because everyone should be asking at what cost. I'll just go to Ambassador Ong really quickly. Just give us the view from Asia. Does Asia view this as a double-edged sword? Yes, of course, but uh, at the moment, most of us are interested in developing the infrastructure needed for our high growth economy. So if there is a guy who is prepared to fork out money, uh, why not? Uh, it is not commercially viable in all this uh, proposal, but uh, since uh, he has a lot of money, uh, we just go along with it. Uh, the important thing, as uh, Secretary Spencer points out, is that at the end of the day, many of these projects are infrastructure connectivity projects which do not yield immediate returns. So along the way, due to whatever reason, maybe poor management or lack of customer to use the infrastructure built, somebody has to continue to fork out money. And uh, in certain circumstances, we see that the um, countries hosting some of these projects may not be able to pay it up. So then they will convert their loan into equity, which means they'll take over the uh, infrastructure in due course. So as Secretary Spencer put it, you have to think about it. Uh, at the end of the day, 
Do you uh, want to relinquish your ownership of many of these infrastructure, which in ordinary times, anybody who want it will find it very hard to get it. But now to this one belt, one road, or what they call the uh, belt road initiative, uh, you can go around it and acquire ownership in due course. Because the fact remains that China has helped a lot of these countries uh, economically, these Asian countries. Yes, but um, the so-called assistance is um, quite uh, different. Uh, they help us uh, in many ways to develop the capacity, but mostly based on trade and commercial uh, deals, uh, transactional, as uh, one of the speakers put it. It's quite different from uh, getting into infrastructure and eventually acquiring ownership of infrastructure if uh, the host cannot pay up uh, their side of the deal. But overall, I think for now, most Asian countries would approach it as something of a uh, necessary evil. <laughs> uh, we try to ride with the uh, economic growth that is uh, seen in Asia. And the fact is that capital is limited. Uh, whatever capital we have in Asia, we probably will have to provide the other part of the governance, which is uh, institutions and uh, other kind of uh, uh, development like education, protecting the environment, all that. So very little money left for actual physical infrastructure development. So if there is an investor, why not? Edward, whether it's true or not, there is a feeling globally that the United States in a, is in a state of self-imposed decline. So there are some benefits then with working with China. Uh, well, so look, I mean, one trillion over five years sounds like a lot. But if you look at estimates of the demand for infrastructure worldwide over the next five years, it's five to seven trillion dollars of investment is the kind of ballpark number we're talking about. So this isn't huge. A lot of it is needed. There are dangers of uh, loans, punitive loans, being converted by China into equity. And I think that's a big explanation for why India boycotted this summit. You know, where, where we see foreign direct investment, India sees the East India Company. You know, they have a, they have a sort of <coughs> historic skepticism of commercial um, investments just being commercial. That said, though, maybe there will be white elephants. There always are with infrastructure investments. But... If you look at the record of the ADB and the World Bank, littered with concrete dams that you know, displaced people that didn't actually um, add up when you did a cost-benefit analysis. Look at um, our public procurement standards in the West. I mean, what, did we have open public procurement when, when Halliburton took all the contracts in Iraq? I don't think so. So uh, the Chinese you know, uh, should be given some due here that they're not actually trashing rule books that are sort of established and set in stone. The Asian in Infrastructure Investment Bank that China launched has got you know, 50, 60 countries now belonging to it. And they made a precondition of joining the AIIB, of it having best practice public procurement standards and so forth. So you know, there, are, there is a double-edged sword here. There is definitely a weaponizing of capital. There, there is a geostrategic element to this. But the world needs infrastructure investment. And China is not, you know, is not shoving it down people's throats. There are it's, 60 countries already signed up. Indeed. There are 60 countries already signed up. And this is a fraction of the infrastructure investment that, that the world needs. And to be frank, the Western-backed institutions, which remain you know, under Western lock, the World Bank is always an American head, the IMF is always a European head, and they don't reflect the rest of the world's waiting in the world's economy. They are not providing this capital. That we're, not, we're not signing up in, in uh, you know, the um, replenishment rounds to vast increases in the, in the balance sheets of the World Bank and the ADB and so forth to provide some of this capital. And capital markets don't do project finance. They're 15, 20 year returns. They just don't do them. So it's a bit more nuanced than China simply gobbling up its neighbors. But I would, uh, uh, one point here so far is that although the AIIB is designed for such kind of inf uh, investment or infrastructure, those money that they have uh, actually allocated for project on the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is still small. Uh, if you look at the overall capital of uh, 100 billion bucks, uh, I think so far they have only spent about 2 or 3% uh, 
-hmm. on the Belt and Road Initiative. So to be fair, uh, they have not yet poured all the money from the AIIB into the Belt and Road project yet. There's also rising debt fears within China as well, isn't there? Yeah. Yes. I, but then debt in China depends on how you look at it. The guy who owned the money are all state-owned enterprises, uh, right. which the government can just simply turn on or turn off. So if the debt is owned to a private company or to an international banking system, and the debt is due and you don't pay, there can be very serious consequences. But when you look at the debt uh, uh, in China, mostly uh, carried by state-owned enterprises, and uh, very often uh, the government can come in and build them up, or they just shut down the pipeline, and then the debt would remain constant. So it's not quite simple uh, to analyse it based on just the amount of debt. General Fenton, uh, just tell us what some of the security concerns are, uh, the challenges for this. Certainly, and I, I appreciate that, because it was one of the things I certainly want to bring up. There's a security aspect here, I think, that we, we certainly focus on. And, uh, you know, on the first part, security inextricably linked to economic prosperity. So we understand that. And, China's uh, desire uh, with some of these ports and maybe to expand the naval presence on one end probably linked to that. But uh, I think as a military teammate, I'm paid to look at the world through a dark pair of glasses to have some uh, spidey senses up about what's really going on. And, and not to do that based on um, just, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, maybe no examples out there. But maybe an example that we've certainly been looking at for some time, the South China Sea is a micro-manifestation of that. My, my sense is there's a potential for some bait and switch. And the bait and switch might be, as we hear in the South China Sea, that these reclaimed features are out there for only peaceful purposes. Maybe to rescue a wayward seaman or fisherman, somebody out there who got lost. But when you take a look, and anybody here certainly can get on the net and Google these things, <laughs> what you see is quite a large runway uh, military emplacements that uh, would make uh, anybody proud uh, who's got a military background uh, with uh, aircraft hangars and uh, not aircraft in them at times and uh, certainly weapons emplacements. And our point back is, is, is that to rescue a wayward fisherman or somebody who's lost at sea? And so when you take that and the continuation of uh, a number of those features out there that have been developed over time, I think almost 3,200 acres kind of reclaimed and the last uh, two years or a little bit more to make these places, what then in Hambantota? What then in, uh, in uh, Gwadar? What then in uh, Djibouti, as has uh, just been mentioned, where I think there's a fairly significant number of PLA forces already? I think so that has our attention. That certainly has our focus. And, uh, and again, as I, I self admit, uh, spidey senses and paid to look at the world through a different pair of glasses causes us to at least want folks to understand that and bring that into the conversation, uh, as well as the economic, uh, the economic pieces. Uh, yes, Secretary. If I could carry on, as I said, I'm not paranoid, but I know everyone's out to get me. Um, <laughs> uh, I share exactly what uh, General Fenton just said, in, in, and I take a step back uh, and realize the, uh, uh, the, the contradiction that China presents. Uh, if you look at, take Piraeus as an example, they've done uh, some very significant investment in the port in Greece and the traffic through there and the dollars flowing through there has actually helped Greece out in their present situation. Um, that's fantastic and, and that's, that's the positive side of the equation. And then I go and look at the Spratly Islands and the Nine Dash Line and uh, it flies in the face of every other uh, responsible nation that uh, either uh, follows unclose or, or freedom of navigation. I was sitting down with uh, Admiral Harris uh, the other day who has a very interesting posit. He said, uh, take a look at this. He said, when Tiananmen Square happened, the world was absolutely appalled at China and put them in the penalty box in complete disgust. Um, 20 years later, when the Olympics happened, the world beat the doors down to hug the panda. So there's 20 years it takes for the country, the, the world to forget. 2049 is the 100th anniversary of the revolution and the, what could be the strongest uh, socialist uh, economic society celebration on the face of the earth. 
If we back up 20 years from, from 2049, we're in the period where we can probably see some aggressive actions, if not some outrageous actions, and the hope is they'll forget in 20 years and be at our door. If you take that as a precept, um, China is a conundrum in that regard. Uh, and we're going to have to, it's, it's my job, it's the general's job to look at the uh, side of what we're going to have to do if, in fact, uh, they start to restrict travel lanes and they start to restrict free travel on the uh, on the high seas. We will not tolerate that, period. So what will you do? Yeah. There's going to have to be some sort of coming to the table, hopefully in a negotiated manner. Uh, as we say in Washington, please have the conversation with Secretary Tillis because you don't want to have the conversation with Secretary Mattis. But oh, as, we, as, do what I would, yeah. what I'd answer two, two other things on... Uh, on the security aspect. So certainly as we look at the security aspect, one of the uh, takeaways for us is what is a belt and what is a road, certainly it can also be military access lines. So the, the, the linking together the various ports, and passing through various oceans at some point certainly are great access vectors and same on land. The second is what we're doing right now is we're certainly out there every day in the Pacific asserting the right to sail, uh, fly or operate wherever international law allows. And the freedom of navigation operations are about that, are about not ceding international space, those domains of uh, sea and of, uh, and of air uh, that have been discussed in the international community as places for international travel. And we're out there ensuring that that, that continues. But, well, I mean, as Ambassador Ong said, if a guy comes along and says, I'm going to build you roads, I'm going to do this, I'm going to create business in your country, you're not going to turn them away. There, there may be those out there who are, and I don't know that there's, a, there's not a lack of buyer's remorse out there right now as you go from place to place and hear about some of the experiences. And that, I would offer that certainly as somebody who gets a chance to travel through the region. There are stories starting out there about buyer's remorse and what folks have gotten themselves into. Is there buyer's remorse, Ambassador Ong? Depends on some of the circumstances, yeah. But I think the uh, Southeast Asian countries, the ASEAN countries, uh, they look at the issue of the South China Sea quite different from the Chinese investment in the Belt and Road Initiative, yeah, because uh, they, they see it as two separate things. Two separate, yeah, two separate issues. And uh, while they may welcome Chinese uh, investment in infrastructure, I think the countries of ASEAN, which are involved in the dispute in the South China Sea with China, um, they don't look at the. Uh, 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 the issue has been uh, welcoming investment and all that because it is a sovereignty uh, angle involved. And uh, as uh, the general mentioned, uh, there might be impact on uh, freedom of navigation and overflight. Yeah. So um, this far, I believe that most of the Chinese diplomacy has been uh, concentrated on trying to contain uh, the South China Sea in a specific sphere and they are not so easily uh, convincing to try to involve that South China Sea issue with the Belt and Road Initiative. But we must bear in mind, traditionally, the Chinese have been using continental land routes rather than the maritime sea route that uh, we are seeing today, yeah, General. So they, they, this is new for them, uh, having uh, ports and uh, you know, connecting points on the, on the ocean. Uh, I think that their policy is still being uh, resolved. Uh, uh, intern agency process is still uh, going on because the Belt and Road is something quite different. As I say, it's infrastructure. Whereas the um, activity they do in the South China Sea, uh, reclaiming uh, some of the reefs to become islands so that they can use it to measure their exclusive economic zone and so on and so forth, these are different issues which uh, the ASEAN country would like to put it separately. You know, it's interesting, uh, uh, putting down my naval binoculars for just a minute, uh, if you look at, uh, uh, from uh, Deng Xiaoping, when, we were, when it, China was an inward looking, wait the time, let's grow, and now we have uh, President uh, Xi saying, we're gonna go outward bound right now. Um, 
I, I think when you say who can, what, what country can be scorned for accepting an infrastructure uh, a shot in the arm, this is where the global community, I think, needs to weigh, weigh in and mandate and say, okay, China, you want to come to the global stage of international trade, you have to be transparent, and you have to come to the norms and the precepts that we operate in. So everyone does know uh, the rules of the road, and everyone does know the terms of the loans and what's going on. I'm just going to bring in Edward. I agree with everything the Secretary just said, and, and, and the General, uh, about the security dimensions of this. The rules of the road point is very good. Uh, and I know you're, you're public servants and you're doing your best, but your president has just pulled out of America, out of the TPP, which is the gold standard of rules of the road. Uh, he then gave a speech in Da Nang last week mm -hmm. um, in which the message was America first, America first. It wasn't we're in this together, that this is not a zero-sum game. It was America first. We need bilateral trade deals in which we get a surplus with you. And unsurprisingly, nobody... Nobody is taking him up on that. Um, and they're not going to, because you know, bilateral obviously favors America. America's huge. Whoever else it's going to be is going to be small. Vietnam, for example. They're going to do collective multilateral, the kinds of things that America has taught the world. Um, so the fact that the president is saying something different to what you just said, at this point, with China showing this kind of ambition, is, is I think, um, a huge and epic strategic failure. Um, and uh, and it's, America really could be winning this situation, um, but, but it's not. And so just one other sort of point, after Trump spoke in uh, Da Nang, uh, Xi Jinping spoke. And Xi Jinping spoke in words that you just used. He used your language. Um, he has a plan. Trump doesn't have a plan. So I mean, to quote Tim Geithner, plan beats no plan. And I think this is, as I say, an opportunity that China couldn't have planned for. And they are making the most of it. But I agree with every word you have just said and that the general has just said. But I think it's really worth pointing out there is a president here who is saying exact opposite. On that note, I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, <laughs> and I'll take uh, two or three questions. If you could please stand up and introduce yourself. And please keep comments uh, and questions short, please, because we haven't got much time. Um, so uh, yes, if I can take one there and uh, the gentleman just there. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. I'm Michael Bausakiu, uh, former spokesperson for the OSC and a columnist. Um, you know, it's interesting, um, Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of Modern Singapore, used to boast about what a special relationship he had with the Chinese officials, and yet he went to China, tried to set up a whole bunch of uh, special economic zones, and they didn't work out, they flopped, and a big reason for that, he actually told me once, was that it didn't have high-level support. So even friends have problems in China. My question is, uh, you know, wherever you go in Africa, you see a lot of Chinese investment. In fact, uh, what we're seeing playing out in Zimbabwe right now may have a Chinese element to it. Uh, Mugabe is good friends with uh, the Chinese premier. There's a lot of Chinese investment in Zimbabwe. I'm wondering, um, their lack of respect for human rights, for labor codes, bringing in their own workers, could in itself create instability in some of the countries where they invest. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you see that as a risk, as a, as a concern. Thank you. And we'll just one there, please. Hi, my name is Ajwal Almadi. I work as an economic advisor to the president of Afghanistan. And one of our major initiatives is regional integration projects. So I just came from Turkmenistan, where we uh, had a regional economic forum there. Um, I work on the TAPI pipeline, which is a Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India natural gas pipeline that we hope to initiate soon. Um, and we were recently inaugurated the Chabahar port, uh, which is a port initiative between uh, Iran, uh, India, and Afghanistan. And so, uh, these sort of initiatives are very important for us. Some of them align with the One Belt, One Road, and some of them are actually in contrast to them. But uh, it's, it's a vital interest for us. And so one of the questions that, come, that I'm faced with is, uh, for example, when I talk with Indian businessmen, is they're not exactly sure of the stance uh, of the US as it pertains to, it could be the China One Belt, One Road, but uh, as it relates also to Iran regarding the Chabahar port. Okay. So the question for the panel is, um, uh, what is the US position there? Sure, thank you. And just uh, the gentleman there, and then we'll come back to this. 
Thank you. I'm Manoj Joshi from the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. Uh, the question I wanted to ask Mr. Luce, uh, you look at any of the maps that the Chinese put out on the One Belt, One Road, they all head to Europe. We haven't had Europe in this discussion. In my view, Pakistan, Zimbabwe, or Tanzania, or um, Kenya, uh, these are minor issues. The real goal of the uh, One Belt, One Road is to consolidate China as the, the power in Eurasia. And you can see from the, the railway networks that have been created across Central Asia, the use of the Russian network, the sea, the port of Piraeus, which has been bought up by the um, Chinese, and their investments in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is the springboard with which they intend to go to Western Europe, which is the richest economy in the world. So I think the, um, uh, all these other small states are distractions. And I have a feeling that the Chinese don't mind if they default in their loans, because these then become dependencies. So, so, so they are quite happy if, the, uh, if Sri Lanka or Pakistan or anyone defaults, you know, 5 billion, 10 billion, no big deal. But their goal, 2049. 2049, they want to be up in the economic scale. They want to be producing innovative, uh, original goods, which they need a market. So the market is not uh, Pakistan. The market is Europe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll come back to the panel now. Um, so the first question that we had was Chinese investment in Africa. Do we see it as creating instability there as well? Um, perhaps General Fenton, if you wanted to answer that. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't be the one to answer that sure. since I'm in the Pacific. So okay, so sure Secretary Spencer, if Africa. you want to. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for that. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if the Navy can help the Army out here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. no, sir. We have a football game coming up for those of you who don't know. Um, uh, if you look at uh, China's activity in Africa, which started in the, in the 90s, um, and this was obviously way before uh, uh, BRI or any, I think, concerted efforts, it was extraction of commodities to help uh, grow fundamental growth within uh, China and, and, and to feed the machine there. Um, and I think it actually did uh, teach them a huge lesson, which was um, you can't come in and, and uh, acquire uh, rights to the resources, bring in uh, uh, Chinese laborers, displace local laborers, displace local companies, and expect to live happily in that community. Um, uh, speaking to Mr. Luce's comment, yes, uh, uh, President Xi has said all the right things in, in, in Vietnam uh, during the, the conference, and it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out because um, Track record to date uh, in Africa has not been that good, and it is destabilizing in that factor. So that's where we get concern. Yes. Can you answer the other question as well, then? I that can't the, remember if, what <laughs> the other question was um, this, the U.S. stance on, on places from Iran to Afghanistan, Pakistan, is just not clear. Uh, my canned answer for that is I'm focusing on the U.S. Navy, and it consumes 100% <laughs> of my resources. Uh, so that's. Um, uh, I, I don't really have a formative answer there. Uh, uh, one of the things, one of the comments I will make, which, which when I bring this up in conversations with people who do not touch um, the U.S. military, they're, they're kind of surprised sometimes, so I'll, I'll put it out there. Um, on all fronts, uh, and I think the, the general might endorse this also, but if you don't, please speak up. On all fronts, uh, the professional U.S. military communicates with uh, every single military uh, on the face of the earth, whether it be Russia, whether it be China, uh, whether uh, there might be a couple of outliers in there. But there is a professional line of communication that is always in place and must remain there at all times because uh, we have to have communication to ensure uh, uh, stability. Um, and, and sometimes that comes as a, as a surprise to folks. But uh, that, when we talk about stability in regions, we do have communications that are going on. And you, you all, I'd, I'd like to just take that a little further. The discussion earlier about uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, events in Vietnam, I would tell you from the Pacific Command's perspective, to the Secretary's point, we have phenomenal relationships in the region. Uh, the partnerships are thicker than they've ever been before. We recognize that uh, many of these are not, uh, you know, solvable. Any of these challenges are not solvable by one country, and frankly, not many of them, not by two countries, but really by a coalition of teammates. Uh, we have what is more habitually a multinational approach to almost everything we do out there. Very, very tight ties. So, I, you know, there's been discussion earlier in 
at the conference about a retraction in the region. And from the military side, I, I think it's uh, stronger and the bonds are thicker and deeper than, than ever before. Uh, and they're not f focused strictly on, on uh, you know, hard power pieces. There's humanitarian assistance and the disaster relief efforts that many of us go to together if somebody's in need in the region. Uh, and many of the, the nations in the region, our partners are fantastic exporters of that of their own in that type of capability and capacity. So I, I just, I, I want to make sure at least, sure. and I speak only from the PACOM perspective, which is why I didn't answer General Waldhauser's AFRICOM question, uh, as it could have been for, for his team on the China piece there, that we absolutely have uh, very thick, very deep relationships with our teammates uh, in, in the region. And most of the approaches we take are multilateral in nature. Sometimes four or five or six of us that will work an issue uh, and, and uh, has just gotten better for the four years I've, I've been there. If I could put a point on that, and just to uh, carry it outside of PACOM, as far as the Navy is concerned, if you uh, have listened to uh, Secretary Mattis's three priorities, number two is hug our allies. Um, as he says, being the historian that he is, our, uh, uh, if you look uh, through society and, and history, uh, those cultures that have uh, allies, strong allies and strong bonds go on for many, many centuries. Those that don't are in the dustbin of history. Um, as far as the U.S. Navy is concerned and our charge going forward, we are out there hugging our allies and, and hugging new relationships. I mean, what we're doing with India, Sri Lanka is, is fascinating, it's, it, it is exciting. What we're doing with Vietnam uh, it, it is amazing. We're just sending a ship over there, donating a ship uh, uh, to the uh, Vietnam Navy. Uh, so we, we are, as far as just even outside of the PACOM area, it was, uh, enhancing yes. what General Fenton said. It, it is truly to enhance existing relationships, deepen them, and also make new relationships. And Edward, there was a, a comment there for you about all roads leading to Europe and wanting to have more of a discussion about Europe on this panel. Yeah, there's, there's clearly, um, I mean, a huge <laughs> geopolitical Eurasian sort of element to the One Belt, one, to the Belt Road Initiative. Um, I mean, it should be mentioned, though, that the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, you know, Europeans um, rushed to join it, perhaps slightly unseemly rush, led by my own country, <laughs> by the David Cameron government, um, which has then prompted many of the other Europeans and Australia eventually to join the AIIB. Will these projects give China leverage in Europe? Well, Piraeus Port has been mentioned, and Greece's vote on what the European Union's stance yeah. should be at the UN Human Rights Council has changed. Um, so, you know, I, I am sharing all the perspectives about the potential for China to weaponize this capital. My, my concern, and I am admiring of America's alliances in the region and its amazing multilateral record at that level. It's just the cognitive dissidence between the commander in chief and everybody else that, that I think is a concern. Um, I, being British, cannot you know, help but see things through the Brexit um, <laughs> lens now. And countries like Britain are, you know, again, in a rather unseemly fashion, I think going to be, um, going to be begging China for investments. China's already running, um, taking over the biggest nuclear power plant in Britain. Uh, all kinds of other assets. There's going to be fire sale kinds of conditions. Um, and China, you know, is thinking strategically, and we are not. We're talking strategically here up on the panel, but we're not acting strategically as Western powers. Does that concern you, Secretary Spencer, when you hear that, you know, Britain is rushing, you know, has rushed to join, join the AIIB and, and would be rushing to join any other initiative by China? Um, Yes, uh, <laughs> it does. I was, can't think of any other answer because it actually, it, it's, a, it's it, it, I, I think Mr. Luce hit the nail on the head. Um, China it, it has command of the clock uh, and they think very strategically and, and, and in a longer term nature. We are, in the Western world, I believe much more transaction oriented and much more tactically focused. And, and it's to our, our own fault, I think, and we really, Talk about a cultural shift. I don't know how we get there, to be very frank with you. And again, my job is to make sure that we have security on the high seas. Um, uh, any sort of, uh, of, of threat to that, we have to pay attention to. And what we've learned is you've got to pay attention early. And again, if everything's transparent and in the open, and we know exactly what's going on, that helps. Just open up the floor again. Uh, just two questions here. Uh, uh, yeah. 
Hello, I am Mauricio from Mexico. Uh, my question would be this, how would you link uh, this panel to the earlier panel? We were talking about the importance of China uh, in, the, in regards to, to the North Korean issue. And that right now, it seems to me that we've been talking about how to counter or stop these uh, Chinese strategic views. So how would you link these two issues and how would you work with China to solve North Korea while at the same time uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, try to, to stop the effort of, of the, this expansion that could undermine <coughs> certain nations and so forth. Thank you. I believe. <coughs> uh, Luis Rubio, Mexican Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, I think that it's pretty obvious that there is a geopolitical agenda behind this uh, challenging U.S. hegemony uh, and made probably easier by, by President Trump's stand uh, at present. Two quick comments. One is that China has built more infrastructure in East Africa in the last 10 years than <coughs> the World Bank has done in its whole history. And the other one is that there's the argument that China's plan is really to rebuild the British Empire, but through logistics, not through colonies. Uh, any comments about that? Thank you. Uh, and I'll just take one here, and then we'll come to the front. Yeah. Joseph Joffe, um, my question goes to the US Navy. Uh, you've been telling us we have to pay attention, we have to look out what they're doing as they expand into the Pacific with these little islands and uh, <clears throat> all the way to Djibouti. And my question is, what are you going to do about it? You say, well, we might, we'll have to have a conversation. The strategic problem is, once you are there, as the Chinese are, you have to dislodge them. And dislodging is always a lot more risky and dangerous um, than somebody who puts his pawn there. Um, is there any way that the US can itself grab the initiative and confront the Chinese with being there, with getting their firstest, with the mostest, so to speak? Thank you. And I, one question here, and then I'll come back to the panel. Thank you. Rocky Mead, uh, Chief of Defense in Jamaica. Um, I think we have made a lot of important points here, and there are different ways to tackle challenges. So I don't think it's a secret that all the countries with the ability for dominance will want to be dominant. It's no secret what the ultimate aim of China is, but they are planning long term, they're putting their resources there. Now, you can deal with that in two ways, either find ways to block them and prevent them doing what they're doing, and then you know what alternatives are provided for the countries that need infrastructure support. The other alternative is to provide a more attractive plan. So, Because I don't think the states that are seeking support want to deal with the necessary consequences down the road, but maybe they have no option. So it's, 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 it's nice to say there's some alternative motives, and, and yes, there are. But what's the other plan? And if there's no other single country with the economic depth to provide an alternative, what about a coalition of the willing who sees an alternative to get together and to provide a real alternative for the countries that need infrastructure support? Thank you. Ambassador, I'll now come to you, uh, because obviously there are great concerns about China's relationship with North Korea and the current state of play. So if we can um, please explain for us how that plays into the One Belt, One Road. Well, basically, I believe that all the countries in ASEAN, in Asia, we want to continue to grow economically. <coughs> and the way to do it is to use the old uh, order that most of us have been socialized with. So if we can continue to expand trade, have you know, easy access to market, uh, this will be attractive to China. And if you have a outbreak of violence in the uh, Korean Peninsula, it will affect everybody's uh, economic growth. And that will not be something to the benefit of uh, China. So I think to connect what uh, we discussed earlier this morning and with what we have now, basically the strategy of China is to continue to 
open up market, access to market, as Edward and the gentleman, Mr. Moshi, say about, uh, Joshi say about going to Europe. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, now the Trump administration is changing the language and, in fact, also the strategy. So all these have now thrown a spanner into the works of Chinese uh, thinking. It was based on economic multilateralism, free trade, market access, and now is America first, or what we call uh, bilateral uh, liberalism, uh, or bilateral dominance uh, in uh, calculating uh, economic and trade uh, development. So I suppose people are still learning how to reconcile all this. But the fact is that China's strategic goal is to open up market. And the original uh, uh, plan was to bring Chinese goods through the railway and other road access into Europe. Uh, so that is a strategic plan which I think Xi Jinping still maintained. Then along the way, other things like bilateral issue came up and opportunity came up, going to Pakistan, going to Djibouti and all that. So the thing that we worry about in some port, uh, part of uh, Southeast Asia is that can C continue to maintain his strategic goal? Because once he started to broaden all these things, all the various bureaucratic agencies in China, as well as all the bilateral relationships, all come into play. So his very strategic goal of using the Belt and Road Initiative to get to market, to maintain the international trading system, is now all convoluted because there are bilateral considerations, how to, how to help Iran, how to help Pakistan, how to help Sri Lanka, blah, blah, blah. So that is the, the, the trouble today. And how do we now connect with North Korea? Uh, the North Korean situation, uh, no one can have a good answer. And I think American leadership has given us different uh, uh, idea of going forward. So we need clarity from Washington, D.C. how to deal with the North Korean situation, how to deal with these kind of uh, uh, greater initiatives coming out from China. General Fenton, did you have some? I, I did, Yalda. And uh, so I, earlier I, I talked about uh, how I view the world and I paid to view the world through a dark pair of glasses. But I got to admit in front of everybody now, please don't hold it against me, I'm, I'm also an optimist. Right? And, and I, I got to say that because when you look at the, the region, the region in which I live right now, the region in which certainly the United States is a part, a huge part, it is uh, uh, by many accounts, certainly now and in the future, probably one of the mo most economically diverse and probably important regions in the world. And when you think about the number of folks that live there, I think the, the, the account now is more folks live inside the region than in the rest of the world. And by 2050, we're told that more folks will live inside that region than in the entire world right now. And three largest economies are there. I, I got to believe there's something beyond one belt and one road. As the Sec Def likes to talk about, and Secretary Mattis, there are many belts and many roads, and there should be many ways. Beyond physical infrastructure being built, where, where's the, the virtual, the digital capabilities that exist out there when you talk about our nation, India, Singapore, uh, 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 Japan, South Korea? There are just a lot of opportunities, and, and an assessment might be that we focus a lot on one way, one belt, one road for OBOR, and I've got a colleague in the Pacific with us, Mohan Malik at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies that likes to say, sure, I'm thinking for OBOR as well, but order based on rules and many belts and many ways. And so, you know, my, my optimism kind of comes out in and, and that way that because of the potential and certainly already realized and more to go, there ought to be thoughts on many belts, many roads many ways in which we get after this. And again, not just physical development or, or that type of construction or infrastructure. And then just to take the comment on China vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, I, I didn't have the honor to sit in the earlier panel, so I don't know exactly where that went. But I, I can tell you that Admiral Harris has certainly been on record, I think, as a lot of our seniors in, in the administration, certainly in PACOM, we talk it, that we just we assess China can do more in terms of uh, the, the resolution on things in North Korea. There, there's a relationship between China and North Korea that we think needs to continue to be, um, be uh, leveraged for that to be uh, solved via diplomatic means. 
And so I would just say that from our perspective, it's certainly that we, we think China can do more on that. And that's what powers do who want to be in the global scene. Uh, they, it's been said that they should be able to chew gum and walk at the same time, take some bit of criticism, and also be able to get after very complex problems. Edward, did you want to pick up on that? Or just a very brief thing. In general, if I could borrow your dark glasses for a second. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> then, uh, These yeah. are my optimistic glasses. <laughs> There's your optimistic glasses. Um, the, the, the beyond the One Belt, One Road, the investments China is making in artificial intelligence, the investments it's making in cybernetics, in all kinds of things that um, you know, will, will dictate the future of the global economy. And the acquisitions, we've talked about its infrastructure investments, but Chinese acquisitions in other markets of smaller AI companies, the number of unicorns in the world that are Chinese, it's about a third of the billion dollar non-listed companies in the world now, startups are Chinese. 40% of global e-commerce goes through Chinese companies. It's Tencent, it's Alibaba, et cetera. Um, and then this very clever um, acquisition of American AI companies below the $100 limit that sparks a CFIUS, um, a, a CFIUS scrutiny. Um, so there is, there is, again, a Chinese strategy here beyond the sort of infrastructure level. And, and sorry to, to belabor the point, but there isn't a Western one. Which comes back to the question that was being asked. I mean, what's the alternative then? If, can the US and the West offer an alternative, Secretary Spencer? Well, just to, to, to go back to Mr. Luce for a second, it, it's, there's a fascinating group uh, inside the Pentagon, uh, OSEA, the Office of Commerce and Economic Analysis, that um, has been looking at this whole uh, issue. And uh, I, I won't use commercial names, but they, um, they electronically disassembled a turbofan engine and drilled down as to the ownership of the manufacturers of the subparts. And they found in the neighborhood, they had to go down four and five legal layers to find out at the end of the day, 20% of the parts made in that engine were owned by China, Inc. Uh, and of those 20% of the parts, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15% of those parts were sole supplied parts. Um, there is a definite strategy. Uh, China Inc., uh, and I'll be bold enough to say it, it's RDNS, Research, Development, and Steel. And it's blatant, and it's happening. Uh, corporate America has to wake up to it. Global corporate has to wake up to it uh, and address it. Uh, and in some cases, it's not an easy, it's not an easy answer. Uh, the, the concept of, of, of the islands that was asked of the Navy uh, the, the gravity of, uh, of, the, of the hat that I wear in Title 10, which is to man, train, equip, and supply, uh, means that I don't point the weapons, but, but I take America's treasures in both dollars and, and, and lives and, and, and put them in harm's way. Um, it's, a sobering, it's a sobering application of power, and you hope it's the last uh, uh, resort. Uh, the only thing that I've learned in the last 10 years of working around Washington, now, there, are many, there, there are many more levers than feel apparent. And we have to be bold enough to use other levers because the kinetic, the kinetic order, it, it, it should be the last order to go. Uh, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Just one at the back there, please. Thank you. Hussein Haqqani, uh, Hudson Institute, otherwise born, raised, jailed in Pakistan. Um, my question is very simple. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, uh, there was clarity in American thinking that the Soviet Union is the emerging challenge. By uh, 1947, George Kennan's Mr. X article had come about containment. It was easy to make a containment strategy. Uh, Henry Wallace didn't have many takers. So by 1948-49, the contours of a containment strategy had started emerging. What I'm seeing is not only lack of strategy, as Edward Luce has rightly pointed out, a lack of clarity. Is China a threat? Or are we going to just look at it from the angle of uh, American corporate interests and in, uh, companies that are uh, deeply invested in China and are happily making money from China and so therefore do not really care if the stewardship of the world passes on to China? And a secondary layer of that is the lack of clarity in situations like 
relating to Pakistan. I mean, there's no doubt that Pakistan is very clearly aligned with China, has been consistently. Its ambitions are very different from what America would like it to be. And yet, while PACOM understands it because it works with India, CENTCOM doesn't because while working with Pakistan, they end up becoming advocates of Pakistan. So with that lack of clarity, how will we actually have a strategy in relation to China in the immediate future? Thank you, Hussain. And I'll just take um, this lady just here. Yeah, just very briefly. Hi, yeah. Thank you, Alyssa Ayers from the Council on Foreign Relations. I want to pick up on this issue of the lack of clarity and the kind of mixed messages coming from the Trump administration. <clears throat> to me, I think one of the most important um, strategic statements that the administration has made is in focusing on the idea of the Indo-Pacific, kind of expanding the idea of what Asia means to incorporate India as a part of that geographic region. In the same speech that Secretary Tillerson made to roll out that strategy, he also spoke quite a bit about the problem of what he called predatory economics, which was referring specifically to this issue of non-transparent financing in the Belt and Road projects that have left smaller countries in a, you know, a debt trap. What I see happening from our government is a lack of connection between our economic policies, Ed referred to the TPP pullout, but we're not talking about development finance and where we could be doing more on the development finance front. Uh, our Secretary of the Treasury at the World Bank IMF meetings did not endorse a call to expand the capital base which would allow the World Bank to be doing more on development finance, exactly. providing a kind of alternative to the enormous investments that China is making in the Belt and Road. So I would just welcome some reflections on this issue. How do we better link up an economic strategy to meet the strategic needs of what China is doing? Uh, OK, so we've just got a couple of minutes. So if we can sum up uh, really quickly just uh, this lack of clarity, lack of strategy. This is democracy at work, right? So everyone has to offer their opinion. Uh, in my opinion, I feel that you need to have strong leaders. The leadership matters. Uh, it's not like many of these issues are appearing for the first time. But in the past, there is someone in charge, and they say, OK, this is a way to do it. We may not all agree, but for country, uh, we do it this way. And then we see how the opportunity come up, and we deal with the situation uh, as and when. The other element that buttresses all these things is uh, what uh, General Fenton mentioned about the uh, rules and the law. Yeah. So we need to go back to all these uh, uh, specific uh, premises which we have used in the past. But unfortunately, now politics is such that we have to go through this phase. We just have to have enough stamina to uh, withstand all these uh, uh, knocks and uh, uh, obscurity and whatnot. But as you said, democracy at play. That brings us to the end of our uh, session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please thank our panellists uh, for their very interesting Thank you. Thank you.